we have the super dad here, Jason Wilkins. Thank you for joining us, talking about reporting in digital forensics. And I can tell you, I heard Jason share some of his knowledge on how to properly report artifacts in the past, and it is brilliant. So thank you for doing this for everyone here. Um, you have thousands of people watching you this time, so no pressure. You're amazing. Thank you for all that you do. Now I'll hand it over to you, sir. All right, thank you. Well, my name is Jason Wilkins. Like you said, uh, I work for Clayton County Police Department uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. The, like I said, the airport is in the northwestern corner of our county. I live in Jackson, Georgia, hence the accent. Um, 10 kids, yeah, 10 kids and two dogs, two cats, a rabbit and 10 chickens. So you probably hear them chirping outside. So uh, yeah, I, I took um, SANS 4585, uh, Heather was the instructor, and we got down to um, the uh, the challenge on Saturday, and we you know we did all of uh, the exercise and everything, put our report together, and and it made me realize you know all the classes that I've taken over the past couple months, uh, I I'd never really learned how to put together a forensic report. That was one thing that you know I completely missed. Uh, now, some of the tools that, they, that we have and we use are, um, you know, they, they have tool reports built in, uh, and some will let you take notes on your examination, but nothing was taught. There were no classes that were taught on specifically how to rep your, represent yourself in writing uh, in a way that, you know, may be presented in court that you will have to testify with and uh, possibly against. Um, so I thought that, you know, I would go on uh, control alt delete and, and do a, uh, actually, uh, I, I kind of got voluntold. I, <laughs> I suggested it and, um, Heather said, uh, oh, thanks for volunteering, Jason. And you'll be great. <laughs> so, so I, I put that together and did that. And, um, and this is kind of an evolution of that speech. Uh, all right. So I told you about myself, um, Actually, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself and my background. Uh, if you're if you're attending from another country, uh, this some of these uh, standards and, and laws, these rules will you know be less applicable to you. But the guidelines for for writing is uh, you know universal. So good writing will always protect you. You know, and, and being able to follow your report in an organized and uh, you know manner will will make it easier for everyone to. Uh, understand your findings. So I was uh, eight years in the Navy. I did um, five years active in the, the as a quartermaster on the USS Oak Hill. It's a amphib. And then I got out and did three years um, reserve with the CBs, uh, can do, that's our motto. Uh, I did 15 years as a firefighter, EMT, hazmat tech and rescue tech with a Fayette County and Henry County Fire Departments. So uh, I have a very diverse background. I know a lot of guys, I, I hear a lot of people talk about how, you know, their, their roadmap to where they got is just, you know, so diverse and out there. But, you know, I, I think that, that that's a good thing uh, in a lot of cases because it gives us, um, uh, you know, unique perspectives and um, attitudes and, and just uh, history behind, you know, why we are who we are and the way we go after things. So I, I have a associate's degree in criminal justice from Iowa Central College, and I liked it so much I went back and got another one in computer networking. Uh, they didn't offer a bachelor's program, and, and at the time, they didn't offer um, anywhere uh, a digital forensics bachelor's degree program. This was, you know, in 2007, so I had to kind of put my own together, and that's what I did. I, I did one in criminal justice, one in computer networking, and then I tried to get hired on in different agencies and, and nobody would hire me without experience. Didn't matter if I had the education. And anyway, you guys know the, the pain. So uh, I did um, four years. I, I quit the fire department uh, and went to uh, work in the corporate world at the Carl Starr Group as a network analyst. Worked there for four years. And then uh, I finally, you know, I, I always wanted to get into digital forensics. And so I finally got that moment when um, the police department was hiring for a crime analyst. And I thought, well, I'll just get my foot in the door, you know, and go from there. Well, I, I didn't even know, but at the time they didn't even have a digital forensics 
lab or anything at the police department. Uh, but I got in and I started doing crime and analysis and um, they, uh, they, they saw that I was kind of a little technical savvy. And so they asked me to build the department's websites. And so I, I, I did, I, I learned HTML and CSS and JavaScript so that I could build a website. And, um, and I did that. And so they said, Hey, you know, you'd be a great guy to, uh, maybe create our first digital forensics lab here at the police department. And so I threw myself into it and uh, we got a magnet license and uh, we already had a, a Celebrite license at the, um, the DA's office and he and I go back and forth with our tools, but um, yeah, they, they put me into the, uh, the classes and I started learning everything I could, man. I, I grabbed, you know, free classes everywhere. I took the autopsy eight hour course for law enforcement. I took uh uh, classes through um, Carnegie Mellon that's offered through FBI Academy. I mean, everything I can find that, that was free and online. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, uh, not free. The, the SANS course was absolutely mind blowing. Just the amount of information that I, I took in in a week. Um, so, yeah, uh, built their digital forensics lab from the ground up. Um, and now I've been asked back by my uh, my, my alma mater, Iowa Central, to uh, teach their class on digital forensics in this new cybersecurity program that they are opening up. And I, fun fact, am also the uh, inventor of Rictameter. I, yeah, I wrote poetry in high school and we had kind of like this little, uh, uh, what, do you, what was that movie? Um, movie with Robin Williams, anyway. Uh, yeah, we, we, we had this little poetry group and, and we invented different styles of, of poetry. And that was one of them that that I, I, I contributed to. So yeah, my name's in Wikipedia. That's, that's kind of a big thing for me. <laughs> so moving on, that's me. You know, I have 10 kids and a whole lot of animals. My, my wife, you know, we love Disney and she thinks that she's Snow White. Um, so that said, we're gonna talk about the importance of reports and why you write a report a digital forensics report. You write it to communicate the results of your forensic examination, uh, to prevent, present evidence that might support further investigation, uh, and to provide justification for collecting more evidence sometimes, um, or maybe to provide a basis for disciplinary action. Um, you know, uh, expect to be, assume that all of your digital forensic reports will end up in court. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm speaking from an American perspective and things may be different uh, in other countries. You guys are all tuning in and that's wonderful. That's one of the, the one thing I love the most about this virtual uh, summit. Um, but always assume that your report is going to end up in court and that you're going to have to defend it um, and that it's going to have to meet the standards that the court expects. You should always look at your report as your first testimony in the case. Uh, opposing counsel will look for an opportunity to attack the facts that you present, uh, whether you determined them yourself, extracted them from other reports, or expected testimony of other witnesses. You need to know what facts affect your opinion and what facts don't. Uh, most courts in the United States now require written reports from expert witnesses explaining your investigation and findings in civil cases. That's in Rule 26 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. All right, so what is uh, Rule 26? Uh, it's disclosure of expert testimony, and it states, quote, unless otherwise stipulated or ordered by the court, this disclosure must be accompanied by a written report prepared and signed by the witness. That's you. Uh, if the witness is one retained or specially employed to provide expert testimony in the case or one whose duties as the party's employee regularly involve giving expert testimony. Uh, and then it goes on to list everything that the report must contain. Um, federal rules 702, 703, and 705, they pertain to testimony of expert witnesses and their qualifications. Daubert is, I mean, everyone's probably familiar with Daubert and Fry. Daubert is followed in 80% of the states, and it states that expert witness testimony is based on sufficient facts or data that is the product of reliable principles and methods, uh, and therefore your testimony, according to Daubert, must be scientifically valid. Now, the other standard Fry, uh, still followed in some states, uh, Illinois, Minnesota, New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington, I believe. Uh, it states that the testimony is inadmissible unless it is deduced from well-recognized scientific principle or discovery 
Um, so it must be generally accepted. So that's the two differences. Dalbert must be scientifically valid. Fry must be generally accepted. You know, everybody's doing it. And it may not have, you know, a process or a, a, a method that has been scientifically uh, tested and, and, and is repeatable, but if everybody's doing it, then it's okay in those courts. <clears throat> so regardless of the standard that's applicable in your state, uh, according to federal rules, uh, your report should include the following, all opinions and basis for your opinions, uh, related exhibits, photographs, diagrams, charts, uh, your CV, your resume, uh, with publishing history times 10 years, fees paid times four years, jurisdiction like your U.S. District Court uh, for Eastern District of Washington, uh, style of the case, John Smith plaintiff versus Paul Jones defendant, the cause number, case number, whatever, uh, date and location of the deposition, name of deponent, and some other stuff. So yeah, uh, I saw this. Uh, Josh Brunty posted this on Twitter the other day, and I thought, hey, that's perfect. That's what I'm going to talk about in a couple of days. So, uh, and and with someone like Josh, if, if you don't know already, you know who he is. He's an associate professor at Marshall University. Uh, these these uh, committees like SWGDE, SWIG, OSAC. He's, he's been on those committees. Okay, he's he's done a lot for the community. He's so when somebody like him, who's authored books and published journals um says this then you can take that as a uh, reliable advice so that you know he says using methodologies that are not generally accepted in the digital friends community might disqualify your findings uh, another piece of advice always keep transcripts of your testimony uh, because lawyers use services called deposition banks uh, which store examples of expert witness testimony uh, some have hundreds of thousands on file uh, if they're saving your testimony, it's a good idea that you should as well. Um, that, that testimony can come back. Uh, they, they will use it to ensure that you haven't previously testified to the contrary of what you're saying at present. So um, make sure that you have a file of your own testimony because yeah, you may, it may come back to haunt you. Um, it's also a good idea to prepare an examination plan uh, to serve as a guideline for expected questions. Uh, always assume that your audience has very little technical knowledge and that you may have to educate them on technical details in your report. Um, don't use a lot of heavy jargon. Uh, you're not gonna be, the jury and, and the, everyone's not going to be digital forensic experts. You know, Try to uh, explain it as, as uh, little as possible. I'm, I'm often amazed really at every day working at the police department, uh, how many people just don't know how to uh, pin a folder to their quick access bar and, or, or to their, their task bar at the bottom. I mean, basic things. People know how to open their Explorer, you know, their browser, if they even know that it's called a browser, uh, to, to go on and uh, go to Facebook on their phones. And um, I mean, they, they know very limited things. And it just always surprises me at, at the the level where that where that line stops, and um, so you, you really have to uh, uh, look at your your language and your your ex explanation level, and uh, know your audience. All right, so some guidelines. Uh, your professional opinion. Always try to state only the facts that answer the question. Uh, opinions will be stated in response to hypothetical questions. Uh, if your written preliminary report states a contrary position uh, than you take in your final report or testimony, uh, expect the opposing counsel to try to discredit your testimony uh, using your written report. Uh, it's better not to write a preliminary report if you don't have to, uh, unless you must. However, do not destroy a preliminary report or any of your case notes uh, because it will be seen as destroying and concealing evidence. Everything is subject to discovery. Uh, take good notes. Um, you know, I, I, I know some uh, people, I, I use um, the notes app on my computer, but some people have like a, a notebook and they still like to do, you know, pen and paper and, and take their notes, keep those notes uh, forever, <laughs> uh, assign them to a case number, put them in a file, throw them in a drawer, uh, just hold on to everything. You, it can be five years down the road before you're asked about one case and you might have done, you know, 300 phones that one year alone. 
uh, report structure, okay? Um, first of all, that graphic was provided by Alexis Frignoni. I thought it was hilarious, so I wanted to throw it in here. <laughs> uh, include the same information you would for your informal verbal report. Uh, summarize what's been accomplished. Identify systems that you've examined, uh, what tools you've used and what you've seen. Uh, state evidence preservation or protection processes you've used. I know I was kind of surprised to hear in the survey that um, so many people thought that uh, chain of custody was unimportant. Uh, yeah, I mean, not in law enforcement, at least not in America. Uh, so, I mean, keep track and, and state your preservation and protection processes. That'll just protect you. Um, you can summarize your billing to date and the estimated costs to complete the job, uh, identify your tentative conclusion, and identify areas for further investigation. You know, when you get to the point where the evidence uh, stops, then that's where you stop. And if you, if you think that there are cloud accounts or other devices, then list that. Uh, some things to consider are, of course, this is basic grammar, go back to English 101. Some things to consider are write clearly and concisely, use direct language and a natural speaking style, you know, like I'm speaking to you now, uh, while avoiding repetition and projecting non-biased objectivity. Uh, use sequence language, you know, uh, first I did this, then I did that. Finally, I found this. So, uh, so that other people can follow your procedure step by step. Uh, don't be all over the place, uh, chasing rabbits. Um, so like this sequential numbering scheme, it's effective because it indicates a hierarchy. It shows relative importance of the information. Um, I think I was looking um, at, uh, I've been researching for a paper I'm writing on a, a process method for um, five phases of digital forensics. And I saw a, a slide deck that went over um, Brian Carrier's uh, previous process method that is, I mean, like, you know, there's, so many um, uh, sub, sub phases within the phases and the numbering system for this slide deck was kind of uh, hard to understand and follow. Um, so this is why it's so important that, you know, you use the, uh, you know, you have the, the Roman numeral system or, you know, using Roman numerals and, and uh, alphabet, alphabetical letters, you know, one A and B and, you know, not just uh, bullets, but make it so that it's something like a roadmap that can be easily followed and that can, you know, you can use the table of contents to jump ahead and throughout the report as you need to. Some uh, numbers and figures and uh, they need to come after the paragraph where you're speaking about them, not before. So, um, they, you know, they help illustrate things like timelines and call history. Uh, they should be descriptive, uh, but like I said, follow the paragraph that they're discussed. Um, formatting and calculations, consistency is key. Uh, if you indent the paragraphs, be sure that all are indented the same way. Use the same font throughout. Uh, explain your hashing methods, why you chose, you know, which ha hashing method. Uh, provide your statement of uncertainty and uh, limitation of knowledge. Uh, like, you know, the, a file stamp is a reflection, you know, it's, it may not be a reflection of its creation time, stuff like that. Uh, link your discussion to figures and tables in a logical manner and present results uh, that describe what the supporting materials actually show and not what you hoped to find. All right. We're talking about objectivity. You know, you're just reporting the facts, the data that you found, not what you were looking for. Uh, make citations wherever you quote, paraphrase or summarize someone else's opinions, their theories or their data. Uh, references can include periodicals, newspapers, websites, conferences, proceedings, or books. Yeah, this is the textbook that we use at Iowa Central. I got a lot of information from this for these slides. And of course, Brian, always got your book nearby. Cite whenever you you don't want to you don't want to have um, anyone discover uh, that you you know stole information from someone else and that you uh, uh, plagiarized. So I got some example reports. I put them in the chat. I pinned them to the top. 
the Forensic Examination of Digital Evidence Guide for Law Enforcement. That's a U.S. Department of Justice put that out. Um, it's got the uh, example uh, report in the appendix at the bottom. Uh, I say bottom because I'm, I'm used to opening PDFs in the back uh, if you've got the real book. But um, yeah, so uh, it's got a, some great instruction inside of that manual. Uh, I know, like I said, it's the U.S. Department of Justice, and there are a lot of you from other countries, but um, it's, it's still beneficial information. I mean, I, I get uh, manuals like this from uh, the European Union all the time that I, I love, and I use it um, because information, especially free information, is great. Um, I got an example of expert witness digital forensic report. Uh, that's, that's, on, that's up there also. You can uh, go check that out. Um, tool reports. So your expert witness report is not the same as the report that's generated by your tool. Okay, so Celebrite, Magnet, Autopsy, these things, they generate tool reports. Okay, they show when and where the data was found, the, the, the evidence, um, and you know they'll give like a, a, a thumbnail picture of whatever it is that you found and everything. And so they're, they're great. They show, they have timestamps. Uh, they tell you the software version. Um, you know, using a, a tool report to add to your expert witness report is great. So, I mean, I usually go out and buy like a, a, a binder, one of those little binders with pockets in them, a little pocket folder. And so I'll have my resume, uh, my, my report, and the tool report um, in the pockets. So uh, Celebrite uh, generates them, Magnet generates the autopsy, generates a report. Um, and I have an example report, thanks to Miss Heather, here's your GIF. Uh, so yeah. Um, you can download that and it's a example tool report from Celebrite and you might recognize the, uh, the data because it's from the, uh, it's from Ruth's phone from the uh, CTF last year. So check that out and hopefully it helps you. Um, honestly, that is it. Um, this is my contact information. You know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, this is my work phone number and my personal email. Uh, I've only been doing this for a little over a year and a half. Um, so, you know, I, I'm always happy to help. If there's an answer I don't know, then I have made so many friends this year that we were locked inside and forced to, to Zoom everything. And uh, so I, I, I can find somebody that can help. Uh, one thing I have found about this community is everyone is so helpful. And it's just all about you know, sharing and, and, and promoting the, uh, uh, the community and, and the, the skills and the technical knowledge. Uh, I mean, the collaboration that was done uh, on the uh, validation uh, report was just amazing. I mean, that, that just says it in itself right there. Um, so, you know, come find me, uh, ask any question you have there. If I, if I am not able to answer any questions in the chat today, um, then, you know, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm always happy to talk and 